chance if you're still waiting. Um, that would be chapter five of Matthew's gospel. I'm gonna just have a few verses there starting in verse 33 through 37, this next section of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, talking about the commands of Christ, this one is very brief, it's very pointed, but the point begs a question. And it's a, a question we're gonna go to a couple of other passages of scripture. Uh, I don't want you to be overly uh, fearful over the length of these two passages of scripture because I'm mostly going to allow them to speak for themselves. Of course, we'll have comment, but uh, let's dig in. Verse 33 says, again, you have heard it, heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I say unto you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And I think that last phrase is, is very telling. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. <clears throat> You've heard it said of old, if you make an oath, if you swear an oath before the Lord, you are to pay your vows. You, you do what you say you're going to do when you've invoked the name of God, when you swear an oath in his presence. This, this was a reality that, that Jesus was speaking into. And as he's done many times and will do throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, he goes after the heart of the people. Because what he would have been easily misunderstood in saying was, always speak truth. That's a no-brainer. We know not to lie. Always, uh, always speak words that build up and don't tear down. I mean, he could have said a lot of things, but he chose to say this. And he, he's always bringing it to the next level. You remember, you've heard it said of old, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, I tell you, if you look upon a woman to lust after you have committed adultery already, and all of those, if you don't murder, <clears throat> but it's not good enough just not to kill, if you hate, if you devalue, if you tear down another human being, you are in danger of judgment as well. <clears throat> And when it comes to our words, here Jesus goes after the heart of his audience. He's going after the heart of his audience here this morning as well. He wants us to understand what it is he's communicating to us so that we can take heed of it. You remember where we came from to get here. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's this teaching them to observe, teaching them to keep, teaching them to obey from the heart those things which he commands. And here is another command of Christ. <clears throat> But let your yes be yes and your no, no. Whatever else is more than that is of the evil one. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Where does all this swearing come from? Where, where does all this oath taking come from? So what Jesus is getting at is this was the most this was the most revered speech within this culture that there was available. 
These were the most revered people that he was speaking to as well. But they, they would they would look, always look for an opportunity to invoke the Lord, to invoke some promissory, you know, let it be unto me as it is unto this sacrifice if I don't keep my vow. They were always trying to be believed based on how high they were willing to go in a threat to themselves to confirm their word to another. And there, there was a certain amount of one-upsmanship within this. I mean, if one person would... Um, You've heard people say things like, well, I, I swear on my mother's grave. Okay. Well, how about I swear on my mother's life if she's still alive? So you're willing to, if you break your vow, you're willing to knock off your own mom? You know, I mean, well, what are you actually saying? And and they would keep going. That They would go on the city. It May God strike this city dead, the city of Jerusalem. May God strike this whole city dead if I don't keep my word. It, it was a point of pride to them. It was a, it, it was a, an attempt to invoke, and the higher you went up the food chain, the higher you went all, if you go, I swear on heaven itself, heaven will fall before I break my oath. Man, what pride of heart that you know, my, I, I'm of such great integrity that I can't be put in a position to break my word. And if, and if I break my word, heaven itself will collapse. That's what they're saying. All of these things came out of a, a point of pride and a point of the corruption that's in the human heart. See, what, what Jesus says there at the end is absolutely borne out. I learned this, and it was, it was taught to me by, I don't remember exactly how old he was, but Dylan taught me this in, in a very real way, and it made me think back to this as soon as he said it. But he went with me down south by Marion to look at a, a pickup. I was just wanting an old um, Chevy S10 four-wheel drive pickup. I'd been looking for one for a while. They, there weren't a lot of them around, but I found this one. And we went down there to take a look at it. And I looked it over, and it was a little rough, but it, it was all, all I was wanting to do was pull a boat. So it looked sound to me. I took it out and drove it a little bit. It was a little iffy, but it was old, so you don't expect it to be pristine or anything. <laughs> but we get back to the guy's house, and then the haggling starts, and he was just over the top about you know, promising me how good and how reliable and, and was just promising over, on top of promises and, and, and swearing to the, the soundness of this vehicle. And I buy it. We head home. And the farther we get, I don't even make it home with this truck before it is obvious I got took. And I didn't get just a little took. This thing was trouble from the word go. It, it ate tires like, I mean, the, the front end was so messed up that I'm not sure anybody could have cured it. I mean, there, it was, you know, the toe in on it was so bad, I wore out the front tires on it in about two or three weeks. I mean, everything that conceivable that, that could go wrong, it seemed like, was going wrong with this truck one after another. And I was complaining about it one night and Dylan says words to the effect, well, didn't you think with all those promises that he was making that there was something to hide? This is what this is speaking to. 
You, you get somebody that just feels like, you know, I swear on my life. I, so why wouldn't have I have believed you if you just said the truth? If, if, what, what are you adding to the truth to make it believable? Are you so, do you lack credibility so much that your word means nothing? That you have to invoke an external oath? You have to call down curses upon yourself or your city or your family or, or something of honor in your life? You have to call that down on you? Or are you of so little? Is your word of so little worth that it needs other added to it? That's what Jesus is after here. Now, there are people that, I mean, it's just their normal. And I'm not saying that it is always 100% that it is always a, a, a person of ill repute. It may just be that they know you don't know them and you have no track record with them and they feel like they need to add to their word an oath to be able to be believed. I understand that. But what Jesus is going after here is the need for integrity of heart to be a truth teller, to be a person of integrity, to, to be that which is always speaking the truth, even whenever it's to your own harm. I mean, I'm... Yeah, I'll just go ahead and one one of the reasons that I I, I have a, a certain level, and you'd have to talk to others to see what level that is, but a level of credibility within leadership of our company is this: when asked to find out what goes wrong, see that's what I always tell Kathy: this I have a certain set of skills. Um, within the system in, in the company, there's no place to hide. If you did something, your name is on it. And Tracy can typically find that name. So when somebody asks me, how in the world did this happen? When my name's on it, I lead with that. I did that. That was my mistake. You tell the truth. You tell the truth even, even when you're in a position, because when you're in that position, it would be easy to paper over. It'd be easy to paper over your mistakes and, and pass the buck on to, to someone else. If you're in the position to be assigning uh, responsibility but it's when you're able to, you, your, your yes can be yes and your no can be no and you don't have to swear an oath on top of it if you just simply always tell the truth. Even when the truth isn't flattering to you. Even when the truth ends up being costly to you, you speak it. You speak it, even when it's uncomfortable. Now, I can remember once a... a a lady came into my office and she was barely touching the ground. She was so mad. She was just stomping mad. How in the world did this happen? And immediately I thought, I think I know how this happened. And you'll probably leave this office different than you came in. So I do my thing on the computer. I look here and, and I said, and it looks like, and I said her name did this, which caused this, which caused this, and then you have exactly what you initiated. And I'm not, well, I still enjoy it a little more than I should. <laughs> she left my office in tears. <laughs> she, she was almost mad enough to cry when she came in, and then she, she was so embarrassed as she left. See, that, that's what we're talking about here, is, is always being a person of integrity. And that's what Jesus was talking about here to these people. These people were trying to mask an, an evil motive. They, they were trying to 
that they were trying to mask an evil motive with costly oaths, most of which they had no ability to cash in on. I swear by my own head. And he says, you can't even make one white, one hair white or black. I would add to that. You can't even make one stay in if it wants to let go. I mean, what, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? You, you, you're powerless to do anything other than to speak the truth. Now, there are two passages, one fairly short, another a little longer that I'm going to jump to just to speak to the, this whole thing of our speech. Because what Jesus put in the crosshairs with, put in the crosshairs here in his sermon was the speech of highest value culturally within that people. They had great respect for those who would call down oaths on themselves or, or curses upon themselves or upon that which they valued to back up the words that they spoke. And Jesus is just saying, speak it from the heart. If it's true, it'll come true. If it's true, it'll be borne out and you will not be believed because of your great oaths. Anything more than that is of the evil one because what they will do is it will make your truth sound less than true because you feel like you have to have an oath to back it up. Just speak the truth. Anything more, anything more is of the evil one. Here in Matthew, a little farther on in, in chapter 12, verses 34 through 37, he's speaking, of course, to his good friends, the Pharisees, and he says to them, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart or brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account on the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Here it is. Jesus is confronting the Pharisees not for what they're saying publicly, not nearly so much as what they're saying privately, because he knows in their hearts they have murder towards him. He, he knows that within their hearts they are conspiring with, within the Jewish leadership and the Sanhedrin to bring charges against him, to, to a, attempt to see him crucified by the Romans. He knows this is in their heart and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what he was telling them was, you may say it in secret, but what you say reveals your heart. What you say reveals, it's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I would caution you even against that which goes on in your thought life. Because not every word that's in your heart comes out through your mouth. Now what comes out through your mouth does reveal the heart, but, but what your thought life looks like, what, you, what your reactions are to things that happen around you, you may never let hateful words get across your lips, but what prevents you from doing that? Now, now sometimes it's, it's a matter of taking every thought captive, that, that you think that retaliatory thought, but then you capture it, you cast it aside, and you, re, you, you move on. You, you repent of that and you move on perfectly fine. But if you harbor it in your heart and because of your own selfishness, you want to, you don't reject it as a thought. You want to take it 
and, and just embrace it in your heart, but for your own reputation's sake, you won't let it across your lips, that's a problem. Because it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Um, Adrian Rogers, used to listen to him when I worked out on the floor, listen to him almost every morning there when, when I worked in sorting and finishing. And, and that was uh, kind of the highlight of my morning. And, and one of the things that he said applies here. It says, you want to see what's in a coffee cup? You want to see what's in a cup? Just jostle it and see what spills out. That's what we're talking about here. The, the jostling of life. You know, somebody hits you sideways, what spills out? Um, I don't think it's any secret. We've had conversations along this line. You know, there was a time that Kathy said, oh, leave the name out. They just bring out the worst in me. And that was my pastor moment when I said, well, if it wasn't in you, it couldn't come out of you. That's true. If, it, if it's not in you, it can't come out of you. So whenever God sees fit to allow us to be in a place where we get jostled, somebody hits us sideways with something either true or untrue, and we get jostled and, and we have to we, we have to make a decision as to how we're going to respond whenever we see, wrath and anger and vitriol just well up with inside of us. And if it fires out across our lips, that's to be repented of. If it doesn't fire across our lips, if we have the self-control to keep it tamped down, but we still embrace it, if we, if we still desire to, if our heart still agrees with those thoughts that we wouldn't dare speak before anyone, then, then that, that needs to be taken care of as well. A brood of vipers were those who were speaking evil. They were speaking evil. They were plotting evil even, but they were the most, <laughs> excuse me, they were the most respected people within their culture and largely because of their willingness to take over the top oaths to back up their promises. It would be either, either something that was easily accomplished and the oath didn't mean anything because it wasn't a very hard task, or if it was a hard task, it was the, the oath was something that they could not do anything to fulfill the other end of it. Every idle word. This passage speaks that every idle word we will give an account of on the day of judgment. What is an idle word? Idle could have just as easily have been uh, translated vain or empty or, or meaningless. It's words of no value. Words of no value. I'm going to leave that set and we're going to jump to our third and final passage for the, for the morning. And this is in James. And this is a longer passage. So you know, bear with me. We're not going to try to pick this apart and get every last nuance out of it or anything. But, but it speaks directly to the, to the power of our speech. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. And if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Okay, just one thing before we move on. And it says here to not to be uh, many teachers among you, but that teachers are uh, held to a stricter judgment. And that's absolutely the truth. And I am absolutely aware 
of, of my position before God in standing before you and speaking the things that I do to you. Um, I, I've said this many times, but I've not said it in a while. So I, I, I want to take this opportunity to inject this into the message. If I stand before you and I speak something other than truth, I'm accountable for that. If I stand before you and I speak something other than truth to you and you believe it, you are accountable for that. We're both accountable. We're both, we're both accountable for my preaching and my teaching. I'm accountable for it doubly. Because if I speak that which is not in keeping with the whole counsel of God, if I speak that which is not which is not in keeping with truth, then I am purveying a lie and I am accountable for that twice. Once for believing it myself, or worse, if I did not believe it, but I was trying to manipulate you through a falsehood, I would be... I would first be accountable on the personal level and then I'd be accountable for sending it forth. But you're still accountable. You're still accountable for what you believe. Even if you believe nothing beyond that which I say, when you stand before God and you give an account for your beliefs before him, Tracy Bennett said, will not be something that will get you off the hook. It puts me on the hook and God already knows, but it won't let you off the hook. So always be like the Bereans who were more noble than their brethren and they search the scriptures to see if these things be so. So much for not making a lot of comment, huh? Verse three. Indeed, indeed we put bits in horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body look also at ships although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among the members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless God and we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. Okay, that, that passage of scripture there is just very pointed in the, in the power of that is in our tongue and the care that we should take. But the primary, the primary thing that goes through the course of the entire passage is this attention to what we read about there in, in Matthew 12, the heart. This is the opening. This is the opening that that what's in your well, so to speak, 
what's in your well will come up and pour forth. And what, and what he's saying here is if we are in keep, if we are still living according to the flesh, if we are living out of our fallen nature, if, if we don't bridle our tongue, if, if we're not expressing the fruit of the spirit in self-control and that on the heart level, if we don't have a new heart, if God has not taken out the heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh, then we have a corrupted well and out of it is going to pour forth all sorts of vile and evil things. That this is exactly where he's speaking of. And he's talking about no man can tame this. You can't hide that which is in your heart. You are powerless to do so. He was, of course, focused on the negative. James is really good at that. I can be good at that sometimes, to focus on the negative. But this is every bit as true on the flip side. Well, what did the disciples say when they were told, they were warned, do not speak anymore in his name. They said, we cannot but speak those things which we have seen and heard. They couldn't help themselves. Out of their well, sweet water was going to pour forth. Out of their well was going to come up, you know, a, a, not a fire of iniquity, but, but Holy Spirit fire was going to pour forth out of their mouth. They were revealing who they were on the inside. James has in the crosshairs the corrupted heart that is to be excised and replaced with a heart of flesh that's to be given a, a, with a new birth. When you're made a new creature, you'll have a new heart, new desires, new focus, a new speech. That was one of the most telling things about me and my conversion was my speech. And Kathy mentions that when she knew it was real, because she'd seen enough out of me to know, hold off judgment, this may not last long. <laughs> she seen me in traffic. No sign language, no air turned blue with the cursing at the top of my lungs at people that couldn't hear me. None of all that was gone. And she's like, ooh. Got a new husband and didn't even have to get a divorce. This is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we get changed on the inside. God does that work to change us fundamentally on the inside or we have no hope. We, we have, we, we can tell though, largely by that which pours forth out of us. I don't know, but most people that I'm around very much anymore, they know I'm a preacher. So people try to watch their tongue around the preacher. Um, some don't try at all. Uh, others try and are somewhat successful, but if, if pushed into a, a tight spot, if things get intense, if the tempers start to raise, if the pressure is on, it's going to come out. And then it's like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. James, James chapter three, it's what's happened. Can't help themselves. Now they can bridle it. They can hold them back so long, but they, they let it go. They, they let it go. What we're after is the heart change. What we are after is that which it is a well that we can draw from that brings forth truth, that speaks that truth in love and, and does, not, does not withhold truth, 
Because truth is incredibly valuable, especially to those who lack it. So love speaks the truth, but it speaks the truth from a place of love. And the power of it is fiery because it's true of, of godly speech as much as it is of ungodly speech. Godly speech has fire on it as well, but it's not consuming people. It's consuming flesh. It's consuming sin. It's consuming wood, hay, and stubble out of the lives of others in our own life. As we speak the truth in love, do not withhold truth from those who need it. And by need it, I mean that you are aware of their lack of living in agreement with that truth. They may have it up here, but if they don't live by it down here, they need to hear it or hear it again. If you see me, if you, if you see me acting out in pride, then by all means, speak the truth to me in love. No, I ask that you do it in love. Don't just, you know, put the ax to the root. You just chop my legs out from underneath me or something. But, you know, I want truth and you should want truth. And we all want to live in the light of this truth. God's love compels us. God's love compels us to speak the truth in love. We've all seen the, the, the negative power of the tongue. I mean, people have said things that have destroyed entire families. People have said things that have, have created rifts in relationship that apart from the reconciliation that is available in Christ, nothing else is going to mend those things back together. The things that they, they said were just too harmful to overcome except through the forgiveness that's available in Christ. It's only, it's only in Christ that we are able to truly forgive from the heart in a way that doesn't just mean that we were just walked on. And that's usually the objection that I hear whenever you say, you got to forgive. You, you people say harmful, hateful things and, and you got to forgive. And honestly, you got to forgive as much for you as for, for them. You, you got to forgive. You, you got to let them off the hook. Thinking, how in the world? That's not just. That's not good. That's not fair. Well, what was your what was fair about your sin being heaped upon Jesus Christ? Your, your sin was credited to his account. He paid for it in full. That wasn't fair. It was grace. And forgiveness for the hurtful things, for the what, what puts out the fire of somebody else's tongue as it's unleashed against us, forgiveness quenches those flames. The forest fire that would consume the, the whole thing if, if allowed to just run out of control is quenched with forgiveness. You know what this means? Sometimes nothing. But this morning it means I'm done. Lord, I, I thank you for for your word about our words, Lord. And I just ask you to, Lord, bring to our remembrance, Lord, anything that we've spoken in, in anger and haste, Lord, anything that we have spoken that, that we need to go and, and make amends for, Lord. Any destructive fire that we have that we have let loose, Lord, into the lives of others, God. I, I just ask you, Lord, to, to grant us grace, Lord, 
to be able to to go and be reconciled to those that that we've harmed with our words, Lord. And and God for for those that have have harmed us through theirs, Lord. I, I just ask you to grant us grace, Lord, to be able to show grace, Lord, to to truly forgive those and to forgive them from the heart, Lord, for that which was destructive and was was unleashed towards us, God. I just ask you to do that, Lord, in each of our hearts that we would be able to, to walk free from the word wounds of others, Lord. God, I just trust that your Holy Spirit is searching each of our hearts, Lord, that, that Lord, those things that come to mind on either side of that ledger, Lord, that we will recognize that it's your spirit that's that's causing those things to come to the top of our mind, Lord. And I just ask you to, to grant us grace to, to deal with it according to wisdom. Lord, I thank you so much for the searching of our hearts, Lord, for the replacement of our old heart, Lord, with a new one. God, I thank you for your continuing work of, of renewal that, that renews our mind, Lord, that teaches us new ways of, of processing the world around us, Lord, after, after godliness and righteousness, Lord. So I just pray your blessing upon your people as we go from this place. And, and Lord, we trust you to lead us and guide us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. It's one, one thing just to, to remind you, if in the course of any of these messages that we're preaching on the commands of Christ and what he wants us to do with different areas of our life, I mean, if you, if you find yourself in a place where you know on the heart level you want to live in agreement with it, but you're you're struggling and you don't know why or, or you want to counsel together or to pray together or anything like that, you know, just know that I'm I'll make myself available. Whether that's to stay after or to meet you throughout the course of the week, or if there's somebody else, you know, trusted in the congregation you want to get aside with and, and work through those things. Don't, don't let these things pass by just because they're, they seem like they're too difficult. The Lord is fully able to cause us to walk in, in freedom in these things.